This Mitzvah podcast is dedicated Le'ilu Nishmas in loving memory of Nachshon Dov Ben Shmuel, whose yard site falls out on Tu the same day that this podcast is airing. May his soul be elevated in heaven. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. We're up to Mitzvah number 91. And today we're going to do Mitzvah number 91 and Mitzvah number 606. They are two related mitzvahs. And these are the mitzvahs of bringing of the first fruits of the Bipurim to Jerusalem. If you lived in temple times and you had an orchard and you had a field, there are all kinds of tithes that you have to bring. And there's one kind of tithe called Bikurim. And that is the first fruit, specifically the first fruit that ripens in your field of the seven special species of the land of Israel. You take those first fruits, you put it in a basket, and you bring it to Jerusalem, and you give it to the Kohen after you do several ceremonies with these fruits. So Mitzvah number 91 is to bring the first fruits. And Mitzvah number 606 is once you get to Jerusalem and you arrive at the temple, you do the ceremony of the declaration of the first fruits. And that is Mitzvah number 606. When you bring the first fruits to Jerusalem, you do the declaration of the first fruits. And then those first fruits are given to the Kohen. This is a really interesting mitzvah, very unique, uh, very thought-provoking. Uh, the timeline for this is is also unique as well. It can only be brought from Shavuos to Hanukkah, only from the seven species, which are Chita, which is wheat, Seora, barley, Geffen, which is the vine, grapes, Te'ena, those are figs, Rimon is the pomegranate, and Zayas is the olive, and finally, Tamarim, which is the dates. So what happens? Let's go through the procedure and then we'll go through a little bit of the deeper meaning behind this mitzvah. You are a farmer, you have a field, you have an orchard, and you plant, and you do all the preparations, and then you wait, and hopefully you get a nice rain season, and after months of waiting, you walking through your fields, and you see a little budding, sprouting pomegranate. The beginning of the yield of the harvest. And you take a special string and you tie it around the first fruit and you make a declaration, Hare Zu Bikurim. This is going to be the Bikurim. This is going to be the first fruit. And then you wait till it ripens and that fruit that has that special string around it, that's the one that's going to be put in a basket and brought to Jerusalem and offered to the Kohen. Now, unlike tithing, tithing, the word tithe means one, one tenth. So the miser, which is tithing, miser rishon, you have to give 10% to the Levite. With respect to bikurim, there is no necessary amount. It means you could bring one fruit, you could bring a hundred fruits. It's up to your discretion. Just like the truma, truma is also given to the coin and you could give very, very little and fulfill your obligation. So too with Bikurim, you can give very little or you can give a lot. It's up to you. You can make that decision. So if you have a field, you have an orchard, and you're in the land of Israel or the surrounding appendaged, annexed lands of, of Syria that was conquered by David, of the Transjordan that was conquered by Moshe where some of the tribes lived, and you have the first fruits, you are required to bring them to Jerusalem and to give them to the Kohen. If you live far away, and there's a concern that they would spoil along the journey, then you dry them beforehand. You bring them as dry fruits. If you live closely, then you bring them as fresh fruits. Now, there are many details surrounding how exactly you're supposed to package them, and how exactly you're supposed to travel to Jerusalem, and what you're supposed to do along the journey. It's really interesting because there's a lot of ceremony, a lot of fanfare, a lot of pomp in how these fruits are actually brought. So, for example, they have to be placed in a basket. That's the halacha. The Psalm about 10 of the verse says, you place it in a basket. And if you're really wealthy, you put it in a silver basket or a gold basket. And if you're poor, you put it in a wicker basket and you bring it to Jerusalem. But the basket itself 
you can't just take all the different fruits. Suppose you have, you know, you have a, a field and an orchard and you're bringing all kinds of fruits because there are seven different fruits that qualify. You don't just dump them all into the bag at once. That's not what you do. You either put them, each fruit in a separate, a separate basket or you put it in one basket, but you separate it with leaves, we're told. You put nice leaves to separate the different species so it looks nicer. And then we're told in the Talmud that you adorn the side of the basket. If you have a basket full of figs, then at the, at the rim of the basket, you place the grapes to make the basket look like it has a crown to make it look really nice and pretty. Alongside the basket of fruits, you bring also several birds that you're going to give to the coin as well as a gift. According to some opinions, that's actually offered as a sacrifice as well. And now you have all the fruits, you're ready to go, and the journey, the procession, begins. Now, the way they would do it is as follows. All the people from a given region would coalesce together so people don't go up as individuals. So you have a plan, everyone gets together from a given region, all the towns of the given region, they all coalesce together and they go together as a unit. Why? Because there is a general principle in Jewish philosophy called Berov Am Hadras Melech, the larger the nation, the more honor is bestowed upon the king. And just like, you know, if you have a minion, you have 10 people, a quorum of 10 people, that's sufficient to have a minion, but it's better if you have 500 people because that's more substantial, there's more of a nation, and therefore that accords more honor to the king. Similarly, you're going to Jerusalem, you're going to visit God, so to speak, and therefore the more people as possible, everyone gets together and they travel as a unit. And we're told in the literature, the Talmud, that the procession is led by an ox, and the ox has gold-plated horns, and the ox is adorned with a wreath of olives on its head, and there is musical accompaniment for this trip. They have a flute playing as they ascend to Jerusalem. This part I found very interesting. The entire duration of the journey they're singing a song containing one verse of Psalms. And they're repeating it over and over again. This could be a multi-day journey. Depends how far you are, you are from Jerusalem. It could be a long trip. And the entire trip, they're chanting and singing one song, one verse, over and over and over and over again. What is that verse? This is from Psalms 122, verse 1. Samachti I was delighted, I was joyous when they told me Base Hashem Nelech, let us ascend, let us go to the house of God. They're preparing to visit the temple, the house of God, and over and over and over again they're chanting how excited they are that they're about to visit the temple in Jerusalem. To me, I, I love this idea of a trip that maybe takes a couple of days and just one song, one verse, over and over and over again. You do it the first 500 times, you're like, well, I, I, I know, I got it. <laughs> I got it. Once you hear it 500 times, I got it. But once you hear it 5,000 times, it like gets into your bones. It's like hypnotizing you against your will or even you're not aware of it and you've been changed. You're, you're being influenced. You're being transformed. I absolutely love this idea. As they approach Jerusalem, they would send an emissary into Jerusalem and inform the Kohanim, the priests of the temple, that there is a procession, there is a group coming to bring the Bikurim, the first fruits. And then the people of Jerusalem would send out their notables, the Kohanim, the important people of the city, to come greet those who are entering the city, those who are coming to Jerusalem to bring the first fruits. If there was a very large procession, we're told, then the uh, the people of Jerusalem send a large contingency. If it was a small procession, they send a small contingency. And then once they enter the gates of Jerusalem, something changes. Those fruits are now sanctified. 
Those fruits cannot be consumed by an Israelite, just like truma is forbidden to an Israelite. So too, the fruits of Bikurim, once they cross over the gates of Jerusalem, those fruits are prohibited for non-Kohanim. And then that verse that they were chanting over and over again gets changed. Now they sing the following verse in that particular chapter in Psalms 122. Our legs were standing in the courtyard, in the gates of Jerusalem. They would travel throughout the city. All the Jerusalemites would come and greet them. And they would sing specific songs as they enter the temple and as they enter the courtyard of the temple. And finally, they arrived at the destination where the Kohanim were doing their service in the temple and they would give it to the Kohanim, the particular family of Kohanim that was stationed in the temple at that given time. And this food, after the procedure is going to be done with it, we'll talk more about that in a bit. After the procedure is done with that basket, with the, those baskets of fruits, it's given to the Kohanim of that particular time in the temple. Whoever, who you know, the, there were 24 groups of Kohanim and they would rotate two weeks at a time in the temple. And the family of Kohanim that was there at the time, they would be the recipients of those fruits. This is one of the 24 priestly gifts. If you are a Kohen, there are 24 gifts that are given to you. One of them is the Bikurim. It's a great gig if you qualify. So this is mitzvah number 91, the mitzvah of bringing the first fruits to Jerusalem. And then mitzvah number 606 tells us what you need to do once you arrive in Jerusalem. So the person who brings the first fruits, he has to take the basket and the first process is he waves it in the temple. And then he recites a very specific passage from the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 26, Parshas Tisavo. Afterwards, he places the basket near the altar, he prostrates himself before God, and he leaves, provided that he spends one more day in Jerusalem. You don't hightail out of Jerusalem. You don't abscond from Jerusalem. You stay one more day and spend the night in Jerusalem. Now, interestingly, this declaration, this passage from the book of Devarim, this actually forms the the basis for the Haggadah. The Haggadah that we read on Pesach, the majority of the Haggadah story, the Madi, the part where we tell the story of the Exodus, is framed based upon a set of verses in chapter 26 of Devarim. And this is the declaration of the first fruits that is brought to the temple, that the person who brings the, the fruits of the temple recites once they get there. So I want to quickly read through these verses. It's five verses, six verses, in the book of Deuteronomy. It starts off by describing what you have to do when you bring those first fruits to Jerusalem. And then it says, you arrive at the temple and you say as follows, Arami Ovid Avid Aramean, i.e. Laban tried to destroy my father. Laban tried to destroy Jacob. Vayera Mitzrayim, and he descended to Egypt, and they lived there, and they were, you know, a small family. But then they proliferated and became a very large and mighty nation. And the Egyptians did bad to us, and they oppressed us, and they made us engage or do harsh labor. And we cried out to Hashem, our God, and the Almighty heard our, our cries, and he saw our suffering, and he took us out of Egypt with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm and with great miracles, and he brought us to this land, and he gave us the land flowing with milk and honey. This is like a like a truncated version of all of Jewish history. Laban tried to destroy us, and then Egypt tried to destroy us, and they might take us out, and brought us to the land that's flowing with milk and honey. And behold, I am bringing the the first fruits that you gave me, and you place them before Shemit God, and you bow down before Shemit God, and then you leave. Now, interestingly, there are many declarations that we say. There are many prayers that we say. In most cases, those prayers can be said in any language. In this particular prayer, it has to be said in Hebrew. It has to be said in the original language of the Torah. Now, the laws tell us 
that there are a whole host of people who bring the Bikurim, who are obligated to bring the Bikurim, but once they get there, they are not obligated to make this declaration. So, for example, uh, a woman, because she does not, uh, the, the apportioned land of Israel is given only to the men, therefore she would not be able to say, the land that you gave to me, and therefore she would not make the declaration, she would just bring it and not make the declaration. Similarly, fiduciaries, people who are in charge of other people's property, they would bring the Bikurim, but they wouldn't say it because they're not owners. Similarly, a a messenger, etc. There are people who they are obligated to bring the Bikurim, but once they get there, they don't make the declaration. Now, what about a convert? Listen to this. This is interesting. It says that if someone is a convert... They're not part of the 12 tribes, right? They they join the nation after the 12 tribes. And therefore, the tribal lands, they have no portion in the tribal lands. So therefore, you would imagine that when they bring the Bikurim, they don't make the declaration because land was not given to them. That's what you would imagine. But the law says not like that. Listen to this. Converts, even though they did not get a portion of the in the land, this is what we're told in the Sefer Chinuch, the book that is guiding us through the 613 mitzvahs. Nevertheless, a convert would, in fact, make the declaration. Why? Because the land was originally given to Abraham. And Abraham is the father of many nations. And that's telling us that anyone who converts, who joins the nation, becomes like a child of Abraham. And therefore, even though technically they don't have a portion of the land, nevertheless, you they can say legitimately, I own this land because I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm a son of Abraham. I'm a daughter of Abraham. And therefore, I do have a portion in this land. And therefore, you can, in fact, legitimately say the land that God gave to me. So this is really interesting that there are a whole group of people who cannot make this declaration and therefore they just bring the fruits, but they don't actually make the declaration. Now, the Sefer Chinuch, the book again that's guiding us through the Sitra Tati Mitzvos, he tells us an interesting takeaway from this. You know, we think when we come to God, we pray, Ah, the Almighty understands me. He knows what I'm thinking. I don't need to be so specific in my prayer. I just say, you know what? Almighty, help me with all my needs. Here it's telling us that we have to be very precise using the right words in our in our prayer. Don't say something that's technically not true. If you were not a portion of the land of Israel, you did not get a portion of the land, you should not, you don't make the declaration that says you did. You know, we, we like to think that precision is not so important with God. Because after all, God God knows everything precisely. But here he tells us, when you pray, make sure you're very, very precise in, in, in asking for exactly what you want and nothing that you don't want, because it might take our words very literally and very seriously. My grandfather used to tell over the story of the great Rabbi Akiva Eger, who's one of the greatest rabbis of the last uh, several hundred years. Someone once came to him and said, listen, I have a family member who's very sick. Could you pray for them? Could you pray that they get a healing? And the rabbi said, sure, send me their name and I'll pray for them. So they send them the name, and then the rabbi comes back to them after a couple of says, no, no, this must not be the right name, because I could sense that my prayer is not being accepted. Could you investigate, could you double-check that I have the right name? And indeed, he had the wrong name. And we would think, well, you know, God knows who you're praying for, and therefore it doesn't really matter if you're using the wrong name, but no, you have to be very precise in how you pray. Okay, so you, you've you taken the first fruits, you brought them to Jerusalem with all the pomp and ceremony, You've waved it, you've given it to the Kohen, you've made your declaration, you've bowed, and now it's time for you to leave. But again, you have to sleep overnight in Jerusalem. It's improper for you to just hightail out of Jerusalem right when you finish what you need to do. That's not how that's not how it works. You come to Jerusalem, spend the night, partake in the experience of Jerusalem, and then only the following day do you leave. So that's the mitzvah in a, in a nutshell. I want to run through some of the uh, reasons given 
for this mitzvah. And as always, like we always say, that when we talk about the reasons for a mitzvah, that's not the only reason. The real reason is because God tells us. But nevertheless, it's important for us to, to rationalize, to understand a little bit about what are the practical lessons for us. And therefore, it's important for us to try to think about what what are the lessons that we can take away? What are some of the reasons, potentially the reasons, why God gave us this commandment? So first of all, there's a very interesting midrash about this. One of the very first midrashes in the Torah, midrashim in the Torah, the first word of the Torah is beratious in the beginning. And the midrash tells us that there are a bunch of mitzvos that have the word racious in it. For example, the verse says, when you come to Jerusalem, the verse says, when you come to the land, you should take meracious priyadama from the first fruits. So our mitzvah, the first fruits, has the word racious, which is the same word that begins the Torah. Says the Midrash, beracious, God created the world in the beginning. Why did God create the world? Because of Bikurim because of the first fruits. This mitzvah symbolizes what the world is all about. Why did God create the world? That's a good question. Once you accept the fact that God, in fact, did create the world, the next question you have to ask is, why? Why would a supremely intelligent being create such a vast and complex world? Says the Mitzvah, I'll tell you, because of Bikurim. This mitzvah, this, this mitzvah, captures, encapsulates the reason why God created the world. So that, of course, should should elevate its importance in our eyes. So I'll, I'll tell you a few a few different um, theories as to why this myth is so important. Rashi, in his comment to verse 3 of chapter 26 in Devarim, tells us that the reason why we do this mitzvah is to not be an ingrate. God gives you a gift. You planted something, you planted an inedible seed in inedible soil, and look, you have fruits, you have produce, you have grain, you have food for your family for the year. That, of course, some we take for granted. Of course, we just expect that to happen. The objective of creation is for humanity to appreciate and to have gratitude towards God. And the most basic need that we have is just food, food and sustenance for our family. And therefore, in the area where we're most vulnerable and needy, food for our family, it's imperative that we accord appreciation to God for the gifts that he gave us. And therefore, right when it starts to sprout, right when it starts to ripen. And we're joyous and we're delighted that we finally have the fruits of our labor, quite literally. It's important to not forget God, because after all, that's the reason why he created us. We are liable, we are likely to lapse into ingratitude, to take things for granted, to assume that that's just it's nature. After all, nature means that agriculture works. That is what we're likely to do, and that's the danger. And the reason why we were created is to have this conflict of free will, us against attrition, us against assuming that things are just the way they are by nature and omitting, ignoring, obviating God from the equation. The objective of everything, the reason we have Torah, mitzvahs, everything is to remember God, to not ignore God, and to appreciate what he does for us. And this idea is captured in the mitzvah of Bikurim. And therefore, this mitzvah is so imperative and so important. So even today, you know, we live in the United States, most of us. Of course, we have a sizable international audience as well. But this principle is still true. And most of us, of course, are not farmers. But the principle is still true that we must learn to be appreciative of all the goodness that we receive as always, my email address is rabbiwalbajima.com. I look forward to your questions and your comments.